the main challenge would to promote uh, social and economic rights. This is the main objective. Because if we don't, if we do not uh, promote those rights, I'm afraid that uh, democracy will not prevail. Hello and welcome to the Inside the Middle East question and answer series at the Middle East Initiative. My name is Anna Boots and I'm a master's candidate at Harvard's Center for Middle Eastern Studies and an associate editor of the Harvard Journal for Middle East Politics and Policy. Today we are joined by Dr. Mansef Merusugi, Tunisia's first democratically elected president, who served from 2011 to 2014. Dr. Merzouki, welcome to the program. Thank, Thank you, you for joining us. The government that you helped lead from 2011 to 2014 was particularly noted for the compromises that it was able to achieve between the two main factions in the government, the secularists and the Islamists. And how were you able to achieve these compromises? And as a follow up to that, what was at stake for the Tunisian people in achieving that compromise? I think it was much easier than in uh, many uh, other Arab countries because uh, in fact, the divide is not between secularists and Islamists like in Egypt or uh, elsewhere. It was more b between Democrats and, uh, and non-Democrats. And uh, don't forget that in 1990, uh, you know, we have the beginning of the, the dictatorship with Ben Ali. This harsh uh, dictatorship yes, was oppressing uh, both Islamists and uh, secularists. So we come to work together, you know, just to fight against the dictator. And then we began to talk to each other. It was, in fact, due to Ben Ali, to the repression of Ben Ali, that we, be, we learned to, to discuss with each other, to, mm. to exchange. And during, you know, the 20 years uh, combating dictatorship, a um, lot of links, you know, uh, were uh, set between uh, secularists and Islamists. And I remember that in 2003, I have organized uh, an important meeting in France to discuss, you know, the, f the future of Tunisia. And at that time, we reached an important consensus, which uh, was extremely uh, fruitful and interesting in the, uh, you know, setting up the, uh, the, the government of the Troika and then even in the process of, uh, you know, writing the constitution. And you alluded to the oppression of the Ben Ali era. Um, you were a human rights activist before yeah. entering politics. Now, after the ousting of Ben Ali and post-revolution, what do you see as the major, most important human rights challenges facing Tunisia still? Well, at, uh, under Ben Ali, you know, the main, uh, the, the main violation of human rights were uh, about political rights, you know. Uh, uh, let me remind you that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you know, is about, uh, uh, of course, uh, individual rights, political rights, and also social and economic rights. Many people, when they, when they think about human rights, uh, always think about uh, freedom of expression, freedom of association, torture, and so forth. But that's just, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't say a tiny part, but it's just a part of the declaration. Uh, so uh, uh, I think that during the, uh, under the dictatorship, our main objective is, was to obtain the uh, political rights. But now, uh, Tunisia, uh, I can say, well, it's fragile democracy, but it's a democracy. I, I wouldn't say that it's the rule of law like in, uh, in France or uh, in, in the United States, but it's at the beginning of the process. But now Tunisian, you know, uh, they enjoy freedom of expression, freedom of association. So now the main problem is uh, the social and economic uh, rights because uh, many people, you know, still live in under the line of poverty. We have more than two million Tunisian people living, living in very, very bad condition. Uh, so now the, you know, the the main the main challenge would to promote social and economic rights this is the main objective because if we don't if we do not uh, promote those rights i'm afraid that uh, democracy will not prevail and what do you think other countries around the world from the united states to other arab countries have to learn from the tunisian experience well i think one just one message do reforms you know before it bursts because this is the main problem i think uh, uh, Everywhere where, where you have uh, this high level of corruption with, without no, no real reforms, economic reform, then you would uh, push people, you know, to take to the street and to, to revolt. Uh, the only country that got the message, you know, from the Arab Spring is Morocco, the King of Morocco, you know, pushed a lot of, uh, you know, uh, reforms, political reforms and so forth. And this is why Morocco is now uh, currently a stable country. But in Egypt, it's exactly the contrary because the message was not uh, was not accepted by the, the, the 
the elites, you know. So they wanted to, to, to come back to the former situation, but uh, I'm afraid that uh, this would lead to uh, uh, more violence and probably the, the, the next uprising in Egypt could be much more dangerous and much more costful in, my, in human lives. So the, the only message is if you don't want to have revolution, if you don't want to have uh, do reforms. And for the United States, I must uh, say that I'm, I deeply regret that the lesson was not drawn because, you know, supporting dictatorship like the Egyptian dictatorship in the name of stability, it's, it will be, it's really counterproductive uh, policy. I don't believe that supporting dictatorship would lead to real stability. It would just delay, you know, the time of explosion and the time of, and the, the level of violence would be probably higher. Thank you so much for it's joining us and for sharing your insights. Thank you. Thank you.